yeah, so so Niltanum, that's how I'm going to start this lecture. I'm going to go through the whole process. I'm going to go to this, uh, the office hours repo. I'm going to go through that whole process of uh, forking, push, pull, pull request, going through all that. If I sub with Twitch Prime, will it show on the screen? Mike. Uh, <laughs> no, there's no Twitch Prime. You know that. Um, uh, all right, so let's get into it. I want to start out today by going through that whole uh, whole structure with the Git lecture, especially towards the end. It was a little rushed, but I did get through all the material. I don't think we have to. Um, I don't think we have to go through those slides again. Watch the video if you need to need to see that again. But I do want to go through a live example of going through this entire procedure. I'm going to um, fork one of the project repos, clone it in my IntelliJ change some code, push that code. I'm just going to change probably one character today just for the sake of example, and then create the pull request into the develop branch of the original repo. And this is the procedure that we'll have to make a, a contribution to an open source project. So if there's an open source project that you really like, some open source software that you use, you really enjoy, and maybe there's a, a bug in that, maybe there's something you want to contribute and you're ready to contribute to a, a working project out there, this is the same procedure that you're going to follow. There might be some additional steps along the way, anything specific to that library, and the documentation will tell you for that library, the developers will, the team will tell you, they'll have some documentation saying, this is exactly how you contribute to our project. Uh, but they'll overall follow this same, uh, this same Hannah Montana Linux and GitHub, uh, but they'll follow the same, uh, is that a real thing? It's not a real thing, is it? Um, they'll follow the same procedure in general. So. I'm going to the open off the office hours system, and yes, I'll still update this document. I unfortunately didn't get to it uh, before this lecture. I'm going to go to this repo, and I I, I know this isn't going to be a thing, but I gotta know inside no. There will be something with Hannah Montana on here. Hannah Montana. <laughs> Not Hannah Montana Linux though. But hey, for for what it's worth, there's <laughs> there's some people, there's Hannah Montana fans out there. Uh oh, it's on SourceForge. That's I'm not I'm not going down that that hole though. But uh so, oh, I do have something. No, I'm not going to. Should I do that? I actually didn't merge this, merge my branch into develop yet. Let me do that quick. Um, so I want to. All oh, right. I was about to do this last time, but, uh, but they want a pull request. Screw it. Let's do it. I'm going to uh, pull this into develop. So I'm going to pull my my branch that I have here into the develop branch, uh, and I'll just leave it. Um, set the structure of the project. No reviewers, no labels. We're not going to mess with that stuff in 116. I'm going to create the pull request. I'm going to merge it right away, confirm, and now all of that code is in the develop branch. So just to make sure we have, I want to be working on develop for this. So all that code is in the develop branch. What's your favorite distro? Is it compulsory to work on the team project? Well, I mean, that's what we're talking about right now. It's one of the application objectives if you want an A, yes. Yeah, if you want an A minus, then no. It's not compulsory. Uh, so what I want to do is go through the procedure. So what I just did, that was something separate. That's uh, just me maintaining this repository. What you're going to do, uh, what you're going to do to make your open source contribution to this project is uh, is first fork this repository. 
So this repository, none of you are going to have access to this. You won't have, you won't be added as a contributor. Uh, manage access. Oh, shoot. Uh, so you won't be added as a contributor. I, I think only a few people, people who are members of the UBCSC from when I was using it last time, they'll happen to have access, but no one in this class, not even any of the TAs, uh, happen to be on that. It's, this was years ago. I was playing around with this, uh, uh, this organization. So you won't have access to this. So the way we're going to contribute to this is first forking this repo. So we're going to click this fork button, and that's going to create a complete copy of this repository in your personal account. So it's UBCSE, I have access there, um, but it's not like my account, it's the UBCSE, it's uh, it's meant to be shared with everybody. I'm not the owner, not the controller, uh, like I guess I'm the uh, the creator of the organization, so I have permissions, but, uh, but it's not my personal repository. But when I fork that repo, now I have a copy of that repository in my personal account where I have access. I have push and pull access. You'll have push and pull access to your forked repository. And we can see that this was forked six times already, that some of you are getting started, uh, at least thinking about looking at the project, getting used to the procedure. So when I do this, I get all of the branches, I get all of the commits, I get all the history, uh, history of this project, not much history right now, but I get everything with this repository. I get a complete copy of that repository at the time that I fork it. So I have everything except I have access to this one and you'll have access to yours and this will go on your personal account and you'll have this repo in your personal account and when employers or anybody else asks, hey, why do you have this uh, office hour system thing forked from this other repo in your account? You can say that, hey, we were doing this open source contribution thing. We went through this whole process. I know what a pull request is. It's uh, all stuff that's going to look good for you. So we're going to pull this link. At this point, this is stuff that we've done, been doing in the course. This is how you've been getting all of your homework uh, starter code. This is how you've been getting the examples repo. As I'm going to click this clone or download button. Yes, I know some of you click the download zip button. I'd I would encourage you not to do that, but it's kind of late for that. At this point, you can't do the, the download zip. You do have to clone this repo. So I'm going to copy this link. I'm going to go to IntelliJ. Go to version control. I can uh, I can expand this. We're going to be in IntelliJ for a bit here. And we're going to go to version control. Get from version control. Paste that URL. And clone that thing. If this is the first time you're cloning, it'll ask you for your uh, GitHub credentials. It'll ask you for uh, for some setup information. If not, you might have to go in and manually set that up. Uh, and it's going to tell me, do you want to clone this? It's a POM file. Do you want to check this out as a project? Yes, absolutely. That's why I'm doing this. So of course I do IntelliJ. And I'm going to get all of the code. I wanted to click no on that, didn't I? Okay. It had me scared for a second there. And I'm going to have all of the code for the project. All that starter code is going to be here, but not only all of the starter code, something that you haven't done yet. If you, all the, all the other repos only have master branches. I didn't use any branching, uh, but so something you haven't seen yet is this button down here is going to show you all of the branches that exist. So if I switch to the master branch, for example, I switch over to the master branch and we're not going to see any code because I haven't merged into master yet. Nothing's merged into master at this point. Uh, if I go to that initial setup branch, I'll see the same exact state as I do in develop because I just merged those two branches together. And if I go into develop, I can see all of my, my code here. I can run it. Uh, something I do want to change about this, I can run it, but it's going to... Uh, crash when it tries to access the database right now because uh, I don't have my SQL installed on this machine and this is set up to run through Docker uh, so we're not oh, actually that's a different error uh, oh 
No, I didn't run Maven either. Uh, but that's not what we're we're here to talk about. Running and testing the code, uh, we can talk about that at uh, at length and Q and As and things like that. Uh, how to run this structure? The best way is to install Docker and run this Docker Compose file. It does all the setup for you. But I do want to set up a a testing database so you don't have to have MySQL installed. I would actually like to see it run and then crash though. Source it. Uh, so this project is set up a little bit different. The Scala directory is actually the root directory. That's meant to be the root. And now that you say that, that that is going to be confusing, isn't it? Because a lot of you will want to mark this as source. Jeez, I might... Oh, good call on the Scala. I didn't even see that. Uh, so I do want the Scala directory marked as source, the source root for this. I have this set up as a, a Maven project, so I'm using Maven to compile, not just manage dependencies in this. And Maven wants to see this directory structure. Uh, that actually puts me in a jam. Do I, do I change that? So source is the root directory, but then anybody who already forked this repo, uh, their changes are going to be incompatible. It should run and then say the database didn't let me in. These are always the most frustrating errors when something is supposed to break and it doesn't. It's just not, it's just not uh, functioning. But it should say right on this connection, right on startup, it should have said, uh, hey, there's no database. Yeah, I think that's what I'll do. I'll just add it to the Google Doc. Anybody doing this part of the course anyway should... Uh, should be diligent enough to read. I know that sounds weird, but uh, many students don't read. Uh, okay, so um, and and even if uh, even if they do, what I suspect is we're gonna have a lot of students who just don't run the code and don't test it, never actually run it locally, submit broken code, and then not get the objective because they didn't even do any testing that's more of what i anticipate happening unfortunately i mean it's just going to happen so uh so let's make just some arbitrary change here maybe i want to say i'm just going to put an excellent nation point here i'm gonna make it more exciting a ta is ready to help you yes uh so that's my change once I make my change, of course, that's where you would make uh, more changes to the code. I'm going to click this check mark button. First, this actually, uh, those of you who haven't been pressing this button all semester, this is the poll button. So if there are changes, if somebody else makes changes to the repository, granted, this is your forked repository at this point, so there won't be any changes. Uh, but in my examples repo, you if I make a change, I say, hey, I updated this example. You push this button. And that's going to give you all of the latest code from the server. Everything's already uh, downloaded. I just cloned this and I didn't commit anything in the meantime and nobody else is committing to my fork repo. Uh, so it just says everything's up to date. This other button is the push button, commit and push. This file is already added to Git. So Git is already tracking this file. And then I can push this button to both commit and push. I'm gonna add some commit message now more exciting it's more exciting now for when a ta is ready to help and i could just click commit that we're going to see this a lot actually i'm going to click uh, just commit just to show you what happens uh, but if you click the arrow and do commit and push you can get everything done all in one shot if you don't click commit and push you just click commit and this is a question that I anticipate in office hours quite a bit. If you just do commit, 
your code will not show up on the server. You won't see your code on GitHub. So let me let me switch over to that just to make this more explicit. Oh, come on. Uh, so let me go over to GitHub. This is my forked repo. If I refresh, I'm still at three commits. I just committed code, but I'm still at three commits here. That code was never pushed to the server. So I committed that code to my local copy of the repository, but I never pushed that code to the server. So GitHub does not have that code. And there would be no way, if I'm a student doing this, uh, doing the project contribution, there's no way for me to get credit for that um, because there's no way for me, Jesse, not role-playing as the student, as uh, to actually see that code. I can't see anything you committed to your laptop if you don't push it to a server and then create the pull request. So, uh, and that's what happens when you, you click this. If I click this again, I don't get any code. There's no changes. I can't do anything here. I can't go back and click commit and push because I already committed. So that code is already there and it I, I can't commit it again, but I have to go in and push to do that. Go to version control, get, and you have to manually push. Even though it's the same symbol here, uh, you actually, it is a different symbol, isn't it? Uh, but you have to manually push if you commit without pushing. So if you accidentally click that button, version control, get, push. We're going to push that code, get that onto the server. We should get a message that says push successful. Pushed one commit to origin develop. And when I refresh this, I get an extra commit and I get the, that change. I get my message. I can go see which file was changed. If I go to my commit itself, I can see exactly what was changed in that commit through this nice interface that GitHub offers us, uh, which isn't part of Git. Git will track this change. GitHub gives us this nice visual, this nice interface to take a look at that change. So now I'm happy. I have my change made. Uh, if you want to go one step further, you could create a new branch. Uh, in Out there in practice, in the real world, you would never push to develop like I just did. That's a, that's a bad thing. But uh, uh, we're, not, we're not there yet. We don't need to talk about that yet. Um, so I have my change. I have my feature. I'm happy with my contribution to this project. I've tested it. It's all working. Everything's great. And I'm ready for it to be merged into the main project again. So for that, I'm going to create a pull request. I'm going to go to pull request, create a new one. And I'm going to merge from my develop branch, from the branch that I pushed my change to, of my local fork of this repository under my account that I have access to. And I'm going to create a pull request into the develop branch. I marked the develop branch as the default, so this should just show up as the develop branch here. If you don't think about branching at all, the branch is going to be the right, uh, the correct branch here. Uh, but make sure it's develop in UBCSE office hours. So I'm pushing, uh, creating a pull request saying, hey, I have code in my fork of this repo on this branch, and I'd like it to be merged into this branch of the original repo. And I don't need any access to UBCSE slash office hours to be able to create this pull request. I just have, uh, I have to have access to my fork where I made my changes. And then I create the pull request kind of requesting, hey, you should pull this into your project because it's a great contribution. I'm going to click create pull request, take a look, make sure my code is actually there. My one commit, my one file changed. I'm the only contributor. Create this pull request. Then, I mean, actually, please actually put in a meaningful message here describing what you uh, what you submitted and I'm gonna create that pull request I don't have to we're not worrying about reviewers or anything but if there was a specific person who reviews the code for this part of the project you would add them as a reviewer if you're out there contributing to an, uh, a live open source project out there with uh, and they have specs and everything they'll usually say for each module of the project who the maintainers are and you'd want to add those people as reviewers uh, and labels too. They they might have all kinds of structure set up for that. I'm going to create my pull request. 
And at that point, once you click that button, as a student, that's your submission. And then you would submit the Google form to let me know that you created the pull request. And at that point, uh, you're done with your contribution. The, at that point, me, the professor, I come in, or a TA, will come into this the UBCSE repo and take a look at your pull request. When we go to this repo, we'll say, oh, we got a pull request coming in. Somebody's got some... Uh, somebody has some code that they want to merge into our project. We'll see this this pull request. We'll see the comment that you had. We can comment back on it. And we could merge it into uh, and we could merge it into develop. If I click this button, then that commit is going to now be part of the develop branch of the main project which is the whole procedure how often should we commit and push as often as you'd like um, my rule of thumb is every time i'm ending a coding session i'm going to commit and push i'm not walking away from my development environment i'm not walking away from my laptop without uh, committing and pushing Unless I'm just getting a snack or something. Like, I'm not closing shop for the day without committing and pushing. Because uh, you never know when a hard drive failure is going to happen. You don't want to redo your work. And if you're committing and pushing, that's backed up on the server. Unless GitHub goes down, that code is safe. That code's saved. Do you need to use your UB email for this objective? No. Uh, so whatever your GitHub account is, use that account. And then when you submit the Google form with... So you have your pull request. You'll take this link for the pull request, and you'll um, and you'll send that in the Google form. That Google form is going to authenticate with your Buffalo.edu email address, and that's how I'm going to link your pull request with your UBIT. Uh, so that's your way of saying that's my pull request. Then if you know in the off chance that two people submit for the same pull request, somebody just tries to steal someone else's pull request, like it'll be pretty easy to figure out in most cases if that does happen. Um, but I'll worry about that. I'll assume nobody's going to try that. That'd be a pretty bold way to get an AI. Uh, yeah, if so if you want some security against somebody attempting to steal your pull request, you can put your name in it, whatever. Uh, but it's submitting that form. That's how I'm going to verify. Yeah, and I'm not going to, I won't ask for your GitHub username. You'll, you'll link this request, and then I'll have your GitHub username. I'll know who you are. Once you paste this request, I have your GitHub right there. I have your code right there. Uh, everything's a click away. Well, two clicks in that case. I have everything that I need right there. The TAs have everything I, we need. We can see your fork. We can go to your fork repo and look around. Uh, we have all the information we need with just that pull request. Uh, that pull request link. So this is the exact procedure. What does it use in industry? Uh, if anybody wants to shout out any open source project, not the Hannah Montana one, but anything that's on GitHub, I guess. I'd do Hannah Montana if it was GitHub. Uh, I'll take a look at it and uh, and show you their procedure. Maybe that's better for Q&A, though. I want to at least talk about GUIs a little bit today. Uh but this is, in general, this is standard practice. This is how you contribute to open source code. In industry itself, outside of open source, everybody everybody on the team is going to have direct access to the repo. So you would just cut out the forking step. You would, just, uh, you would create your pull request into develop from a feature branch instead of off of a fork of the repo. That would be the, the big change. And then any extra steps that, that they have. You would have code reviews in there. Uh, you'd have more... Uh, quality control steps. You do have to create a GitHub account. Yeah, exactly. You should make one anyway. Like if, if that's a if that's a big feat for you, creating an account, GitHub account. Like you need you should have one already. You should have one anyway. Not already necessarily, but you should have one anyway. Uh, if you're creating one for this assignment, this will be your first project in that repo, or in that account, and you can get your portfolio built up. The, your GitHub account for computer science students, for software engineers, your GitHub account is 
pretty much a big part of your resume. It's uh, it's basically our social media app for the for software development. This is how the community interacts with each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Nicholas. <laughs> this is my pull request. If somebody's that bold to try to steal mine, jeez. Okay. Uh, Discord's repo is Discord open source. I don't think Discord's open source. I did that same thing again. A JavaScript library. Uh, so this will this will work anyway. Uh, so somewhere in here, contributing, they're going to have some way for you to contribute. There's some guide. They want you to know how to code first. Oh, I didn't do issues. I could add issues to this, but it's too late now. Uh, forked repo. It just took me back to the repo. Remember that you can always fork the repo and make a pull request if you want to add anything to this guide yourself. Well, there's, there's that. But uh, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. We can do that during, uh, during Q&A. Discord JS. Okay, so I did find the, the project you were talking about. Uh, but they have all their... Oh, I clicked the wrong thing, didn't I? Contribution guide. Fork, clone... Make sure you're on master, run the thing, code your heart out, test it, submit a pull request. Same same thing we're doing here. Same exact thing, same exact thing. They just have some, uh, some more steps on showing you how to test, which I'll have in the docs. I'll add those to, to the docs. Uh, and I'll probably clean up the testing procedure a bit. Are you able to host the Scala programs we've written online? I'll, I'll talk about that stuff. But I can talk about all that. We have all next week to talk about um, MMO architecture, the project architecture, and all this stuff. We can talk about all that. I do want to get in the docs enough to get you up and running and testing your local copy quickly. But uh, but let's talk about some GUIs. I at least want to get partway through these slides today so we can get to that juicy stuff next week. So we can talk about most of GUIs today, MVC and MySQL tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, Friday. We can get that content in and then talk about the structure of full apps and all that good stuff next week. Yeah, my deployment is on a digital ocean machine. Uh, for If you're talking about you testing it, um, uh, running it on localhost like we have been doing, if you want to host your own stuff, it's uh, getting some server to run on. This is the project is set up to use Docker Compose. So any machine that you have that uh, that has Docker installed or that you can install Docker on, uh, you can do. So if you get a DigitalOcean account, log on to that, clone the repo, run Docker Compose, and I guess you would change a port. You're not going to have my Nginx set up. Change the Nginx port back to 80, and you're live. You'd be live. Uh, there's a bit involved. There's a lot of little details in there, and we I'd be happy to talk about. Um, but it goes quite a bit beyond 116, uh, depending on how you want your deployment set up. When you fork it, is it private, or would it be public? It'll be public by default because you're forking a public repo. Forking a public repo and making a private fork is, I mean... It's not always best practice. I mean, for this uh, for this project, I'm not going to mind, obviously, if you want to do your work in private. Uh, but your pull request is going to be public anyway. But by default, your fork is going to be public. Okay, so yeah, Scala, is, uh, Scala is a little strange at first getting used to the syntax, but it's... Uh, uh, Really nice once you get used to it. Okay, let's talk about GUIs. 
So we've seen GUIs throughout the semester. A lot of the homework assignments have had desktop GUIs. A handful of them, I think two of them, three of them, including Clicker, have had web GUIs. The rest have had desktop GUIs using this Scala FX library. Uh, so let's talk about what was going on there and get you to the point where you can understand all of the code in the handouts. So after today's lecture, and at least after Friday's lecture, you should be at the point where you'll be able to understand all of the handout code I've ever given you. You should be able to go through that and see what's going on. At this point right now, at this moment, uh, you're really missing the GUI stuff of that. How did those front ends, how did those desktop front ends work? So let's take a look. We're using the library ScalaFX. This is an interface for JavaFX, so you have to have both libraries installed. JavaFX ships with, or at least used to ship with Java. This is why we use Java 1.8. This is the primary reason here uh, is to use JavaFX. They removed JavaFX from Java and put it as its own separate library, which doesn't like to play well with Maven. You can't just uh, import it from Maven. So, uh, so our solution is to run Java 1.8, which works. I, I won't say that. Won't. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we're using both libraries. ScalaFX adds some Scala-specific syntax and features onto JavaFX. But we are using a Java library. And for the docs, the ScalaFX docs are really lacking. If you want to figure out ways to expand this, to use this library to build more complex GUIs and do much more than we're, I'm going to show you quickly in class, uh, I recommend checking out the JavaFX documentation. There's really great documentation. It's a really well-established library with all kinds of uh, community support, all kinds of documentation, all kinds of good stuff surrounding that community. I would check out the JavaFX, and then when you see the Java code, uh, convert that over to Scala code. That might sound difficult if you, that's something you've never done, you've never done Java before or anything. It's surprisingly not too difficult. If you see a Java class, you have the class name, and you know the fields, uh, the uh, state variable names. If you know those names, you can usually do that same thing in Scala just by, by creating an object of that type and accessing the same state variables, you can usually um, get away with out really understanding the Java syntax specifically. So that's what I recommend is looking up this JavaFX uh, documentation and then getting an idea of what what is in this library and then um, using it in Scala. So let's build this. Let's build a degree converter. Fairly simple program, but it'll get us all of the elements of the GUI, all of the ideas out there that we need to talk about. So I want to enter a degree in Fahrenheit, degrees in Fahrenheit, click this button, and get those same degrees in degrees Celsius. So let's take a look at how this works. But first, I want to show some, uh, some special syntax. This is some special Scala syntax that we're going to use extensively throughout, um, throughout building our GUIs. Uh, and it's used extensively throughout all the documentation that you'll see on these GUIs. If you're looking up some documentation, or if you're following the links on the, from the course website, you'll see this um, this syntax. So I want to make sure we're familiar with it. Is running initialization code when you create an uh, when you create an object. So if you create an object, you're saying new object, or if there's a helper apply method, uh, like a, like a list where you don't use the keyword new. Uh, either way, when you're creating an object, you put a block of code right after you create that object. And this block of code is going to run inside the scope of the object that's being created. So we can use this to initialize extra variables that, we, that we're creating uh, when we create this object. So if I have this initializer block, this Y right here, is going to be the state variable attached to this physics vector. This is the same as saying this dot y, where this, in this context, is the object that's being created. So if I say y equals 10, even though I set y equals to 2 here, this initial, initialization code was ran after the constructor and after any initialization code, initialization code inside this class itself. And then that y, that 2, was overridden by this 10. And my physics vector is actually 1, 10, 3. So I can do this, I can use a syntax whenever I'm creating an, an object from a class. And we're going to use that when setting up our, uh, when setting up our, 
uh, GUIs. So let's set up our, our first initial GUI. We're going to use this ScalaFX library and just have our first basic window. Let's start with that, creating a window that's going to show up, excuse me, that's going to show up on our screen. So we're going to, actually I want to, want to go over this one. So we're going to extend JFX app. If you recall earlier in the semester, I had that extends app one time uh, when we could have just had a main, we didn't really need that extends app that time. This time we do need extends JFX app to say that this is a GUI that's going to run. JFX app has a lot of stuff inside it, unlike app itself. I was thinking of JFX app when I was getting a little confused on the earlier one, why I use that. JFX app we absolutely need. It has a lot of content in it that sets up the entire GUI. So first we need to import all everything that we need from the ScalaFX library. We have, uh, of course, everything coming from ScalaFX. This isn't coming from uh, from Scala itself. This is not built into Scala. So we do need that in our POM. If you're using the POM from the examples repo, it's been in your POM the entire time, the entire semester. Uh, so you already have access to ScalaFX. We extend that JFX app, which does have a main method in it, um, defined in it. And we're going to use some initialization code. We're going to extend JFX app so we have all that functionality and then overwrite some of its variables to get the look and feel that we need. So we're going to overwrite this stage variable with a primary stage, which is going to be the main container of all the information that we need, this, uh, this primary window. We can give it a title, which will appear in the title bar. I, don't, I guess I don't know what that's called, but it'll appear right there. And then a scene, which is going to be all the content of the window itself. At this point, we can also specify the size, the dimensions, X and Y of this. Uh, there are other, a lot of other things that we can specify when we create these things. Uh, but I just want to get a bare minimum example, example here. And then the scene is going to have a list of contents of GUI elements that we're going to add to the list. Oh, I see. I'll. Uh, I want to get through some of these slides, so I'm kind of ignoring chat right now. But uh, but I see appreciate lecture questions, and my my heart melts. Uh, I'll, we'll we'll talk about it. We can chat after. I'll catch up on chat. Um, so here is where. Uh, oh, I got ahead of my slide a little bit. But here's where a lot of our content, uh, all of our content, is going to go for this window that we're creating. So let's add some elements to that. Creating a window is not very exciting. Let's start adding GUI elements to it. So here is where we're going to get our first um, first real content added to this window. So for this, we're going to add a couple of text fields. Oh, I thought I, I thought I fixed all these boxes. Did I miss that one, or did I not re-download my slides? Uh, maybe I missed this one. But we're, we're going to import all the pr appropriate stuff. And here's where I need a big heads up. Make sure you're importing the ScalaFX versions. Since we do have ScalaFX and JavaFX, we have a lot of the same classes that exist in both libraries. In most cases, we want the ScalaFX versions of this stuff. That The ScalaFX version is going to be the JavaFX version, but with a little bit of extra Scala. Um, Scala syntax and Scala functionality applied to it. There's only one exception to this. When we're using events and event listeners, those are going to be from Scala, uh, JavaFX, not ScalaFX. But ScalaFX does have those classes, but they don't work well with the GUIs. So we're going to import the ScalaFX stuff. I fixed all these green boxes, but I'm not going to I'm not going to sweat it. But I, I swear I re-uploaded that with these green boxes fixed. So now we're going to create a field text fields. So this is where we're going to both enter our degrees Fahrenheit and display our degrees Celsius. So the text field, we're going to create a new text field and use that initialization code that we saw earlier. So text field does not take any constructor parameters. So the parentheses are optional, but we're going to add this, con this initialization block to override the style. We're going to set the font of this uh, of the text in this text box uh, to make sure that we get the font that we need mostly increasing the size to 18 point 
we're going to get that text field, store it in a, uh, in a value, create a second text field where our Celsius is going to go. And for that, we're going to also override the editable variable to be false. So you can't edit the output text field. We don't want people typing in the Celsius directly, just a, a user experience feature. We don't want them type being able to type in the output. Uh, in the output box. Then we're going to create a V box or a vertical box, which is going to take a list of GUI elements and um, and store them in this children variable. Again, we're using that initialization block. These parentheses are optional. For some reason, I decided to add them this time. I don't know why. Um, and override that children variable, which is part of the V box class and then store that in a, another value. Now, when we get to the primary stage where we had that list of content that we're overriding from the, the scene, and um, we're going to put that vertical box in that list. And you can start to appreciate the initialization. We're in an initialization block, kind of, but the definition of the class, and then running code outside of any methods. We're not even defining any methods in this class. We're running code outside of any method. So when we create a new sample GUI class, it's going to run all of this code. When we create the new primary stage, we have some initialization code here in this block. And then inside that, we're overriding the scene with a new scene and using another initialization block there. So I told you we would use this syntax heavily. We are using it quite heavily. It's one, two, three, four, five times on screen already. We're using this, uh, we're using this very extensively. Because I use the V box here, the list of elements here are going to be displayed on the GUI vertically. So I'm going to have the input display, and then below that, I'm going to have the output display. Uh, as you can guess, there's also an H box, a horizontal box, which is going to put, which would put the input display here and the output display right here. So we can control, and then there's also a grid layout. If you look at the calculator, I use the grid layout to get all the buttons in the exact positions that I want them to be. So there's several different layouts. I'm just using VBAX to display things vertically in the order that they're provided. Yeah, I fixed all these. Man, that bugs me. Uh, I'm not going to bother to update it right now. But uh, uh, yeah, so you, and you can nest them. So all of these, I think I can do this quickly. So all of these, uh, all these classes extend, ugh, maybe not as quickly as I had hoped. Extends control. Let me go back to children. Oh, come on. Uh, are going to take these nodes uh, I, I thought this would be quicker to go through in the, the code, but, uh, but through polymorphism, we can nest these all we want. So that's going to extend node. I think partly because it's, uh, Java code pain region parent node. So eventually all these extend node at some point. And then the layouts take uh, take nodes, data structures of nodes. So through that inheritance, and the, the containers themselves are nodes. So because of that, because of that magic of polymorphism and inheritance, we can nest these. So we can have a VBox of HBoxes of grids, and we can nest these any way we want. We can have a grid layout where one of the, the cells is a VBox, another cell is an HBox of VBoxes. We can do whatever we want in, in that sense because these are all nodes at some level. And then the containers, this is a, a data structure of nodes. So everything works well with that. And then we want to add our button. So this button, we're going to override a few variables using that same syntax. The, the width and height, the style, we want this to be bigger and bolder than the other, um, the other values and the text to be displayed on the button itself. We're gonna add that button to our VBox. I'm gonna put it right in the middle of the two displays. 
and that's going to appear in that order in the order that they appear in the list so our GUI looks great but there's one big problem here the button doesn't do anything and I, I can run this code this GUI pops up and I can click this button for days I can enter degrees Fahrenheit for days nothing's going to happen nothing is ever going to display in this Celsius box and that's a problem if somebody actually wants to use this app as a degree calculator a de degree converter um, they're SOL they, they they can't use this app so what we're going to do is add a listener to the button which is going to listen for the button click event and we're going to react to that event using event-based architectures We've been using this, any GUI is going to use an event-based architecture. So we've been using this all along whenever we use GUIs, but now that we have the event-based architecture learning objective, we get to understand more of how that works. So a GUI by nature is going to be multi-threaded and concurrent, concurrent through multi-threading. And um, I guess that's not necessarily true, but, uh, but it's going to have concurrent code and there's going to be an event loop that's running, listening for events. And when an event occurs, it's going to call the appropriate listeners. So a button has this on action variable, which is going to take a listener and then call that listener, notify that listener whenever the button is clicked. So to do that, this listener has to be of type event handler of type action event. When the button is clicked, there's going to be an action event. That's the event that we're going to react to. And we have a handler to handle action events. And that's what's going to go in the action on action. On action is a state variable uh, of type event handler of action event. So we're going to create this button listener class, extend event handler of action event, and then define that to do whatever we want to do when this button is clicked. To do what it needs to do, I'm also going to pass it references to each of the displays so it can access those displays directly and modify, uh, read the input, and then modify the output values. So that button listener, I'm going to take those two text fields, the input and output, extend event handler of action event. This event handler has one abstract method named handle. It takes an action event, or rather, whatever the type parameter is, it takes one of those, returns unit. When this button is clicked, whatever event handler of action event it has, it's going to call its handle button, its handle method when that button is clicked. So we're going to get calls to handle. That's how we're going to react to action events. An action event occurs, the button was clicked. The handle method is called the reaction to that event. So we have an event-based architecture here. We have concurrent code. Uh, this button can be clicked, and as it's processing, as it's doing its conversion, another button might be clicked. Other things might be happening. Um, there could be a lot happening, but we're going to react to that event concurrently. When that event occurs, then we just have some standard math here, standard uh, Scala code, uh, except actually, I got ahead of my slides there, uh, except the input, uh, the text fields that we have to access their values. We're going to do dot text, dot value, and either, uh, either read or change the value of the text of the display. So I'm going to read the value of the text of the input field, convert that to a double, which right here my program's gonna throw an error if somebody adds like three X question mark or whatever, two double is gonna, uh, is gonna throw an error. So for a real program, I would handle that. Um, uh, I would check the user input to make sure they have a real double. Uh, store that in a double is Fahrenheit. And when I wanna chain, set the value of the other text field, I'm going to access that text.value and just set it to a value. I'm going to set it to the Celsius, but I'm going to round to two decimal points here. That's what this syntax is doing. Since this is a whole class, we're creating a whole class here. We can create any helper methods. We created a constructor, as you saw. We can do anything that we can do with classes inside this. So I have this helper method to do the actual degree conversions for me. It's going to take the degrees Fahrenheit as a double. I'm going to do the conversion, return the degrees Celsius and call that function inside the handle method. So we don't have to put all of our code and all of our logic in the handle method itself. We can defer to helper methods. We can have state variables in here if we wanted. We could have like actual the state design pattern. We could do anything we can do with classes 
it, it's all fair game. It's all valid inside this listener. And now whenever we want to use that, create a new button listener, give it the input and output displays wherever you're getting the Fahrenheit from, wherever you're putting the Celsius to. And then that button listener is going to listen for those clicks and we get our proper conversions. And that's where we'll pick up next time. And I did. This is, these are my old slides. I, I updated these. Damn it. All right, so let me switch over to Q&A.